This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Today, we are bringing back Mr. Cameron Pichy for his second appearance on the Power Producers. My man is a partner at All Lines Associates up in Spokane, Washington, and is definitely known for his presence in the trucking industry with Valley Trucking Insurance. Right before we jumped on, you know, we were talking a little bit about mental state and everything else, and I'm going under the knife tomorrow. Um, and we'll see what happens with that. A lot of people probably saw, you know, the post that I did on LinkedIn and Facebook regarding the stroke that I had back in May, Memorial Day week. I know a lot of people saw it on LinkedIn because that bad boy got over 100,000 views on it, which was crazy. Jeez. But, you know, it's it's funny because I think everybody came to the real, you know, the, I, I learned two things from that. A, um, people don't follow every detail of my life like I feel like they do sometimes <laughs> on social, even though we put it all out there because everybody's like, well, you know, maybe this will give you time to make your family important or whatever. And I'm thinking, all right, you freaking chode. Do you even have any idea like anything that I post ever? Like I don't post things about my family on LinkedIn, but my goodness. My family's an open book on Facebook. And then the second thing is, everybody said, you need to slow down. You're working too hard. Well, I hate to tell all of you that said either of those two things, you're wrong. That's not what the deal was. So the fact of the matter is, I was telling Kyle and, and Cameron both that I have what amounts to a small football living on my rib cage right now. It is a lipoma, which is a non-cancerous fatty tumor. And that is what caused my stroke, not because it did anything to affect the blood supply to my brain or any of that. It just freaked me out, man. I came home from playing golf and I went to take my shirt off to jump in the pool and I felt this thing on my ribs. I'm like, oh, wow, what is that? I never noticed that before. Completely freak, like just out of nowhere, shows up, never noticed it. And I had my wife come in and ask her to uh, grab on and take a feel and see what was going on. <laughs> And, you know, truthfully, I tried to uh, let her have me keep it. I told her it could be handlebars for her, but, you know, whatever. Um, you didn't you use the have... no-no yes strategy on that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the problem is that it is uncomfortable at this point. It's like hitting like a nerve or something, so it's given me some level of pain. So I'm going in, and they're supposed to take this thing out tomorrow. I hope they save it so that I can see what it looks like because I feel like we've been bonding for years and didn't know each other existed. But, you know, here's the thing, man. I had an appointment yesterday for my pre-op, you know, two days before the surgery. Obviously, protocols and things are different now with COVID. You know, we have to go in and get COVID tested, and they had to check all my vitals and everything. But here's my problem. <laughs> my appointment was at 1 o'clock. I left at 630 Okay, what? I sat in the lobby of the of the hospital to to waiting for my pre op crap to begin for two hours. That's a substantial amount of time. Then when I got back there, it's like they knew nothing of my medical history. They had none of the transcripts. They were going to give me a bunch of cardiac uh, tests when I had specifically gone to a cardiologist and done everything ahead of time. And the moral of the story here, people, is everybody in that hospital who worked there knew of my displeasure of a two-hour lobby visit. 
and knew that if I, you know, if I ran my business the way that the medical community runs theirs, I'd be bankrupt, man. I don't get it. I don't know how you can go into any business. And by the way, doctors, if, if, if for whatever reason we've got a random doctor listening to this, I hate to inform you, you have a business, period. You're not just treating people as a nonprofit. You're a for-profit corporation, and we are paying you money that we earn to come in there, just like I pay Amazon money that I earn or Wally World money that I earn. And I expect to be treated like a customer as well as a patient. So here's my thing, people. If you needed me for the whole afternoon, just tell me that. Set my expectations appropriately. Don't tell me I'm coming in for a pre-op appointment to fill out a little paperwork and, and be there for just a, a little while. I'd have blocked my whole afternoon off. I missed sales calls yesterday as a result of this. Not happy. Is you, in case you couldn't <clears> Could you it imagine out. if we actually had like a massive listener base that was just doctors and they just tuned in to power producers just for... <laughs> Hey, they just should, for shits man. and gigs. Those would, if you are a doctor and you are listening to this, please send me your name because I know that if you listen to this podcast, you're running your business right, and I'll go anywhere in the country to have you treat me because you wouldn't leave me sitting in the freaking lobby like that. It's fair. But how many Absolutely. times do we do that in our agencies, man? How many times do we leave the prospects sitting in the lobby? Nobody that listens to this show, and if you are listening to this show, you better find Jesus and get your life right so that you can make sure you're tra <laughs> treating people the right way. But it, it, it's nuts, man. It, it's the same thing as not calling people on time, not following up on emails, not providing a quote that answers as many of the questions as you can anticipate as possible. If you're doing I feel like, video it's, way, I feel like it's way worse than that, actually. Like you're at their place of business, like sitting in their lobby for an appointment, like me forgetting to call somebody back at 3 p.m. <laughs> when I've got, you know, all this other stuff going on is way less egregious. Hey, here's a fun fact for you, Doc. I've had one client walk into my <laughs> office over the course since 2018. One, guess what happened? We closed it. Kyle wrote Yeah. It. Yeah. Like, right. I, didn't, I didn't even know why somebody was walking in the front door. And the lady's like, please help me insure my church. Well, okay. Like, never. <laughs> I, have a, I have an ex producer that thought that was the strategy all along. I should have probably picked up the phone and called him and said, we finally had somebody walking in saying they <laughs> wanted to buy from us and didn't know how much anything cost. <laughs> It's crazy. It's so, Cameron, you said you guys have blown up, man. What's what's happened over the course of the last year? I want to talk about that. Yeah, man. I want to talk about your journey of going through 75 hard. I am getting yeah, ready to start it as soon as my surgery is done. And, you know, I'm not going to rip open a gaping hole in my side like freaking Han Solo and the Tauntaun and Empire Strikes <laughs> Back. Yeah. Kyle could crawl in there and stay warm in the winter. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because it gets cold where you're at. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was pretty chilly yesterday. I had to wear a hoodie to work. But I want to talk about that. In, in, I'm an idiot, dude, because I'm, I'm going to go 75 hard and stare Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's right in the face the whole love time. Anybody can do it any time of the year, man. I want to take it and give it the middle finger and say, you know what? Yeah. Here's the deal. I want the absolute worst conditions to push myself through this and watch me beat it down. Think, so are you like not going to be able to eat Thanksgiving dinner and like having he you can know, eat turkey? He'll eat, I'll be turkey. on Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the way that I read it in the book, you just need to pick a diet and stick to yeah. it. Right. So no alcohol. Oh, sugar. Sugar. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, no, the biggest I think, thing, I think Carruthers, the harder part was going through conference season doing it. I'd much rather yeah. probably do the holidays. I didn't think that through very well. when now, I picked Now, Cameron, you understand that during holiday season, there aren't any conferences and the I conferences know. wrap up for me back in, the, they start again in, in January. It was so. very well calculated. In fact, well, before we dive into that, first, I'm glad that it's non-cancerous and I hope you, or wish you the best of luck going mm -hmm. through that. It'll be nothing. So, now, you got yeah, that, no, first of all. I just hope they don't like accidentally rip my liver out because it's attached to this. Yeah, they didn't set the expectations very well, did they? They're trying to give you cardiac test, all this other stuff when they have it all. That's not very inspiring. Well, no, what I, I'll tell you, the other thing that wasn't inspiring <laughs> is when the lady went to take my blood yesterday after I waited for two hours in their lobby, she uh, dropped one of the tubes on the floor. <laughs> And she's like, she's like I, I had to get, I, she said that, that one's garbage. It only filled halfway. And like, she takes another full tube. Then this lady comes around the corner and she's like, Hey, what's this one on the floor? She goes, that one's broken. The tube's not right. You know, this guy's given me plenty of blood, but the tube's not right. It's only full, filled halfway. <laughs> the other nurse is like, that's because it's only supposed to fill halfway. Oh. It stops. 
<laughs> and so I'm like, well, here we go. Now Where were you? Freaking... Did you go to Venezuela? Like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm getting, I'm just getting a Brazilian butt lift in Ecuador. <laughs> is exactly yeah. where I was. Or Canada. <laughs> no, it's crazy, man. So yeah, yeah no, I pre- I appreciate yeah. the thoughts. It's it, it's literally supposed to be like a 15 minute deal. He slices me, gets the tongs out, rips this thing out, sutures yeah. me back up, and I'm off to the races. So it could be you'll be fine. My buddy just had one removed. Video on YouTube. What's that? I would post that video on YouTube. If if I can get it, I will. I have no secrets. <laughs> I love it. Uh, second, I want to thank you um, for everything that you do for the industry, man. If I had these resources when I started when I was twenty, uh, it'd be a crazy ball game. But I also think it hardened me and put me where I'm at. Is the obviously you know the experiences you have to get you where you're at so same man i appreciate that yeah and 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 the reason i do it is because i didn't have that you know when i was in my early i mean even my early 30s when i got into the insurance industry so it's funny because i spoke at innovation this last week and that's one of the things that i said was that i will never hire a producer that's already in the industry because of how hard it was for me to get a job coming from outside the industry I was making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and couldn't get hired for twenty five. Like that is demoralizing, right? And I was willing to bet on myself, and I would even go in. And what finally got the deal done was after all of the pompous agency principles that I now take business from every day declined me. I went to a local Main Street shop who was just launching commercial and needed somebody, and he said, "Why should I bet on you?" I said. With all due respect, why should I bet on you? You know, you're starting out. I'm starting out. This is a marriage made in heaven. I'm willing to do it for a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar a year pay cut and bet that if I get my deal, you know, my commissions right, I can get there again in another year or two. So let's do it together. And I finally got the deal done. But I mean, agency principals, if you want the best salespeople out there. Quit looking at producers because if you're a producer looking for a job, you ain't a producer. You can't close crap, right? No. Nope. Period. End of story. I find it amazing, too, how many potential producers apply. You throw up a roadblock, don't reply to an email, don't call them back on something, give them homework, and they won't overcome hurdles or follow up or be tenacious. I have a lot of producers that legit called me weekly. Hey, give me a shot or stopped in, dropped by, sent emails. Like, they... What would you do in a sales situation? Get a no? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Walk out mm-hmm. the door. Yeah. Like, that's right. the Tommy do. boy. Yeah, yeah the, the Tommy boy shut down. Hey, that's it. I'm out of here. Yeah, I'm done. I've I got a story, you know, kind of relating to that. We, so we were out in Napa this past week. My wife is a manager over at ADP. I love how you just dropped that in there casually. Just slid <laughs> that in there. Went to Tampa for Really Napa cool, by the way. Um, we went to the super sick vineyard that um, – like 465 acres. Uh, that that was that was something that I didn't think that I would really uh, enjoy as much as I did. But um, just stand it, at the at the at the mountaintop, looking out over the valley of grapes, and <laughs> just breathe in extra, and then let it out slowly so that you could consume every. When ounce I went of to Napa Florida, there was no mountain top, so I want to see this mountain top. No, no, no. Yeah, I was no, in, he's Napa. in. He was in Napa. Oh, okay. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, looking out over your vineyard. We you know, we, we make great uh we make wine with blueberries down here. <laughs> have you have you had that by the way? There's one like that I see a billboard for off of I four, like somewhere near Plant City, and I think that we got a bottle of, it wasn't blueberries, it was like an actual vineyard, but it was it was terrible. I mean, no, I know no. exactly the name of it. It's so not that I. far from my house. And I can tell you that their sparkling seltzers <laughs> and craft beers are way better than their really? wine. Okay. Yeah, they're fantastic, and that venue is actually really cool out there. Really, they have a lot okay. of live music and stuff. Yeah, like it's on the other side of the world for you, but for right. us, it's like ten, fifteen minutes from the house. It's a great place to hang out. Interesting. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, finish your episode. But, but yeah, so um, so we were sitting there, you know, my wife and then a, a, a girl in their office, not on her team, but she's one of the top producers. Um, and we were just having breakfast, and it came up like about her friend that applied and um whatever office she applied in kind of sent her an email saying you know thanks but no thanks type of thing and so she reached out to this girl that's that's working there and told her and she's like I, you know i'll just do something else she's like no send them an email and tell them that they're making the biggest mistake you know that you're that you know x y and z kind of lined it out sent it back they hired her immediately so i just i, yeah. I mean I, I think that um, that you're right. I, I I don't know why people wouldn't approach it more like a prospect situation. 
Well, you're going into a sales career. Sell the employer why they should, why they should hire you. It's a yeah. simple equation. Right. Yeah, I agree. I, I just don't, I think that, I don't know. I, I could go on for days yeah. on this. I'm much, that, more, I'm much more interested hole. in, yeah, I'm, I'm much more interested in hearing about you, Cameron, yeah, than man. me ranting. You can get that anytime. <laughs> Absolutely, which I do. Um, okay, so let first of all, uh, David is the reason that I started 75 Hard, um, <laughs> unbeknownst to him, which I actually told him when I saw him in person. He had got this book he posted a picture of. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, David's a gangster. He's doing 75 Hard. I don't even know what it is. I just ordered the book. I had no clue what it was. Didn't look at it. Didn't read a podcast. Didn't watch YouTube. I didn't know Andy Frisella. Got the book. I read it. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Gave it to my wife. She read it. She's like, we're starting Monday. I'm like, hell yeah, <laughs> let's go. So rest was history. So that was, uh, we finished this last Friday, actually, uh, was the last day of 75 Hard. So I know uh, that you immediately go chug a beer. I haven't drank alcohol yet because, well, good for you, man. Yes. Yeah, so I haven't drank alcohol, but I did. And I'm still um, recovering from the sugar hangover. <laughs> yeah. I, feel I, like can imagine. Right now. <laughs> I went two days hard. So, so I think I asked you a while back, David, you had mentioned it, like what it was, but I totally don't remember. So tell everybody what I'm it is. Let, Cameron. Yeah. Cameron, Cameron yeah. Can, yeah, can just sort of outline it for you. Here's the deal, though. For me, this is why I don't think it's – like to, the biggest thing for me in the entire process is going to be getting all of the water in. Like that is going to be the hardest really? thing for me to force it. Yeah, you it. don't drink a lot of water, huh? I No, I do, but, I mean, you have to drink a gallon of water every single day. The reading is not a problem. The two workouts is not a problem. Yeah. The diet is not a problem. I've been on the DASH diet since, you know, May. I've, I've, I've cheated a couple of times, but I didn't have to. Yeah. You know, I don't have a problem with discipline like that. So for me, this is like hmm. mental toughness and discipline. So I think I've already been down that road when I launched my agency. Yeah, and I, I don't want to say people ask, and there's a lot of comments you'll get of, man, I've tried to do it so many times, or that's so hard, or I can't believe you're able to do that for 75 days. It wasn't that hard. It's just structured discipline, and like you get up, I know I need to drink 32 ounces of water. I know I need to go work out for 45 minutes. I know I need to spend 30 minutes reading a book. That started my day every single day. And then the diet, as Carruthers said, I did intermittent fasting. I don't eat till one. I don't have to think about eating until one o'clock. You meal That's prep. Crazy. At one o'clock, you start eating, eat until seven or whatever time. And then I would get another workout in. I usually did a combination of cardio as one of them and then weightlifting. I did like four or five days a week of like heavy, heavy weightlifting. Um, hmm. Kind of, but I also grew up playing sports. I like um, lifting and all that kind of stuff. So it just got back, back into it is really, I lost damn near 40 pounds. Wow. Nice. Um, over the process of this. Well, and that's 40 pounds net, bro. Cause if you were lifting weights, you were, yeah, you're putting muscle on. Yeah, I mean, that's I, heavier than I fat. Put, right. I stacked a ton of muscle on. So like weight or inches wise or appearance wise. Yeah. hundred percent. Sweet. So now kind of the outline, Kyle, to answer your question. Yeah. Two workouts a day, 45 minutes a piece. One has to be outside. So for you guys, that's like heaven for me, it's freezing. <laughs> it was 30 something degrees and raining on my last week <laughs> of workouts outside. Man. Uh, so you do that. You have to read 10 pages of a nonfiction type book, self-help sales, learn a language. I don't care. Whatever you want to read, just nonfiction. The other part's a gallon of water, which to speak to that, David, I got up at like 4.30 every morning racing to the bathroom. So I didn't <laughs> wet the bed every single right. morning. You're younger than I am, man. I'm up three times <laughs> in the middle of the night now already. Dude, I wouldn't go back to sleep. If I wake up in the middle of the night for that, dude, my mind starts going. I'm just laying there. Like, yeah. I can't no, it's go back funny, to man, because I, I was getting so neurotic about closing my rings on my Apple Watch that I would get up to take a leak, and I would put my watch on to get credit for the stand <laughs> while I was going to the bathroom get, and then put it the back on the charger in. and go back to sleep. Yeah, I, I would, man, because the stand is the hardest one to get. That's awesome. Uh, hmm. Well, I got a standing desk, so I'm standing all day. I don't even sit anymore. Yeah, I have amazing. one, too. You'll see it go up at some point during the podcast because I'll, yeah. I'll stand for half the time. No, I love it. That's the best thing I did, man. I bought an autonomous one of those autonomous desks. I yep. love it. Yeah, so do I. It was the best investment I made. I bought a really nice. Actually, you may too. have talked me into it. You may have been the one that I took the advice from. I'll take the credit. There yeah. you go. So talking, so you said board. you you said you guys are blowing up. Talk a little bit about what you got going on. Yeah, man. So business is cool. One of my, you know, I I had thought a long time ago and actually before I had gotten this podcast is like I really need to start a podcast our or my personal niche and focus has been trucking so what do truckers do all day they They're drive the drive they trucks they drive. Man. 
and they listen to stuff. Now, I can't have a podcast about insurance because that's boring as F. People don't want to listen about insurance. They don't sure. care unless you're insurance and then you care. But other than that, so I created a podcast, get a load of this trucking. And all it is is bringing value to the trucking industry or professionals and bringing resources, technology vendors, um, carriers, you know, all kinds of stuff into the mix hmm. and the conversation fold to just add value. So state association, you know, CEOs, vendors, keep trucking, you know, the ELD, there's all these different types of people that can bring value or bring insight or bring strategy on how to set up a company, how to utilize trucking or the trucking industry as an investment for an entrepreneur. There's all kinds of stuff you can do within the industry, just like our industry, you know, that's and pretty so, cool. Yeah. So that, that kind of took off. I'm not getting, that's not the reason for blowing up. There's a, obviously a lot more strategy involved, but we basically went from Western United States to now we're licensed in every state except for New York and mass and then Alaska, Hawaii. So hmm. we expanded that way, picked up a cu couple national referral partnerships that it was basically like 20 trucking leads a day kind of flooding wow. in. And then we, on top of what we get, we get hundreds and hundreds of leads that we've gone. And we basically took our team from less than a handful of people on the trucking team up to 16 and then agency total. And I guess this is a producer podcast. So um, agency total from last year, we ended right about 13 million and we'll, we'll say premium for the sake of this conversation year to date. We're at 18, six. Whoa. Nice man. In a year. And that's everything. Wow. Though. That's not just trucking, but that's the agency. It doesn't matter, goal. man. That's almost a 50% increase. Yeah. yeah. So that's blown up a lot. And then we've refined the sales process, the marketing process tremendously just from getting nuggets. And actually, uh, Kyle should run most of this. Kyle's a gangster on the sales side. I figured <laughs> out by listening to your podcast, by the way, David. So <laughs> it's like Rain so Man. Talk about some of the stuff you've done. Like, what, what have you tweaked? What did you look at and so say, I this is. A, yeah. And one of your things you had mentioned, hey, I'm toying with an appointment setter. Got an appointment yeah. setter. You know, got a is few it, of those. I it, streamlined. You. You're, you're collecting them now? I mean, you have multiples? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for That's sure. That's good. And, and our producers, they're, you know, they are also responsible for outbound marketing, content creation. They've got a database that they work religiously because we've got it narrowed down to our target where they're doing cold calls, constant drip contacts, email campaigns, voicemail drops. They're doing engagement via LinkedIn. And I told them all, I said, hey, go friend or try to connect with every owner of this company on LinkedIn. Take your list and connect with them because then they're going to see the podcast. They're going to see the articles. They're going to see the stuff that mm -hmm. you got to share and establish you as the authority. People start engaging with us, the retargeting and the marketing already kick in. So that'll build that trust. I'm using a little bit, um, David, of what we had learned uh, from Marcus Sheridan on building up kind of the assignment selling mm -hmm. approach where I'm putting a lot more video our landing page to set an appointment now has a video to book a link through Calendly. And then we've gone to a block schedule. And I took this from Brandon of appointment setting spots and getting an appointment set. And then it sets the expectation. You had mentioned, hey, send them an agenda of what to expect. Brilliant. OK, here's what to expect. Here's how it helps. And here's why it's going to be beneficial for you to do your homework. For meeting with us once we get to that it's a conversation to close the business and Ex explain the for, explain the block um the, the block yeah, appointment man. stuff H hold on before you do that though i want everybody listening to this to understand one thing this guy just told you that he went and revamped his sales process by taking the best he could find from three four five mm -hmm. different people and making it work for him i literally just closed out innovation talking about the fact that not everything that everybody does is going to work the same way in your agency that it works for them. And you need to take the best that you can from everybody and then turn around and make that work for you as your own. But the key to, to that that I heard was that Cameron proactively went out and sought knowledge. Like there's so much stuff that you can get without having to spend a dime or spend very little to buy a book and read the book or listen to a podcast or whatever else. 
The difference is he's actually taking action on that stuff instead of saying, oh, that sounds cool. Maybe I'll try it someday. <laughs> you know, I mean, so with that's that what we talked talk about, about all the time is taking yeah. the action. It's the it's the yeah, so in, 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 for those of you who don't know who Brandon is, it's Brandon Smith who just released his new book called Let's Go, the producer Let's planner. Let's go, Brandon. For 2022, <laughs> and this podcast will probably drop after the one that I recorded with him and James Jenkins live at Innovation. James loves his mobile podcast rig, and I'm actually going to replicate that, and we're finally going to launch the Babel podcast for Bay Area business leaders after the first of the year. But um, we recorded it live, and the three of us are each going to take that raw recording and put it on our on our podcast stream to help Brandon get the word out. But that's one of the things he talked about was you know having blocks, having days set aside for specific things. Like Monday is marketing, Tuesday yeah. is whatever Tuesday was. I don't remember now. But, yeah, no, um, I li- and I, I like the I approach. I've been a proponent of block scheduling for years. But to try to get my team to adopt it has been like pulling teeth. And so yeah, they had to hear it from somebody else. <laughs> yeah. So I actively seek like David was kind enough to come and talk to my sales team. I seek all these people that I built connections with, which in my mind I look up to. And there's not many in the in our space that are willing to give time and say, hey, come talk to my team. Here's what we need to talk about with Brandon. I left it open. It just so happened to segue into that. And I actually bought a whole lot of his books for my whole team. Um, and he came and chatted and they heard it from him and guess what my whole team has block schedules now it's amazing so you know that's just kind of a simple trick uh and kyle what's your question specifically on that i I was just going to have you explain what the block scheduling is yeah man so david touched on it so i from an owner approach will be a little different than a producer approach because i've got days where i need to focus on marketing content agency meetings setting mm-hmm. appointments. I still actively sell. I'm, I'm addicted to it and I can't, it, you know, it'd be like your best player sitting on the bench coaching. You know, I sure. just, I'm not there yet. I know some people, Hey, you need to work on the business and run your business. I'll get there. I'll work on it. But until then I'm going to blow up sales and just kind of perfect it. Cause I'm in the trenches and that's what I tell my team too. I'm doing everything that you guys are doing that I'm asking you to do. It works. I know it works. Follow the steps, follow the process, read these books, Never split the difference. All these things that are the Bible, the answers are all right there. They'll help you overcome these. And then, you know, I just try to push them to be better. So I, on Sundays, look at my week ahead. And actually, let's back up. I also took and did Living My Best Year Ever. I've done that in the past for many years by Darren Hardy. It's a workbook. Has you outline your three big rocks. For me, I had a financial rock, basically double my income, health rock or fitness and mental, lose like an obscene amount, like 70 some pounds. Um, and then the other one was build a deeper and strengthen my relationship with my wife and family. And so if it doesn't hit those three things on my calendar and like make those stronger, I usually don't have it on my calendar. I get rid of it. It doesn't hit my time. I say no. So I look at my week ahead. I need to shine during certain times. It's appointments, obviously with prospects or clients. It's setting the meetings for my team because I need to come in high energy and provide tremendous value to them to motivate them and and just pour resources because I don't want a meeting that I can email. You know, our meetings typically aren't boring. So I've read books on how to give meetings and, you know, best practice and that kind of stuff. But um, and then the rest of it's just kind of scheduled around, you know, what I need, what needs my attention to run an organization along with doing the sales. So I do that in a couple ways, too. I've got a dedicated team underneath me. I've got a few executive assistants, a VA support, um, and a couple other people that assist me in the sales process. So I built and I'm building kind of as a little test to also replicate out to the team an assembly line approach to the sales process with an appointment setter, somebody that will also integrate in to help with follow-up documents to get ready and do the homework for our appointment. I come in, deliver the pitch, close them up front, Okay, they commit, they want to work with us, great, let's get the paperwork started. Somebody else processes the quote, gets the paperwork started. I deliver a proposal and close with video or in person, depending on, you know, if they're here or Florida, or if they're big enough, I'll fly, you know, whatever the case is. Uh, and then we onboard them, they get, and I've built a ton of video and automation for um, contacts, video introduction for their account manager, reminders for the account manager to call and introduce themselves, a reminder to call three weeks after the onboard from the producer. 
hey again welcome i want to make sure you're taken care of did you get this did you get that did you get you know whatever hey reminder your new payment's coming up it's a new company don't forget did you get all your welcome kit all that kind of stuff and then there's mm -hmm. quarterly reminders hey connect with an agenda here's what we need to work on this is what we promise to deliver this is what we're improving here's the extra services that we're offering just make sure that they're implemented and onboarded and we're actually providing the value that we promise to deliver um so yeah, that that's a kind of in a quick nutshell, a little bit about what's going on there. So, so you mentioned you brought in a VA appointment setter. How long ago was that? Um, six months or so. Okay. Say, within it took a little bit to get him off the ground, and luckily I found one yeah. kid who was uh, actually an agency rep, a really good friend of mine. Um, her somehow, somehow she knew this kid, he's finishing up college. He's 21 years old. He's only part time, but I tell you what, man, he sets at least one or two appointments a day. He's a beast nice. on the phone. He's done sales. He's done, um, door to door sales, mm -hmm. selling roofs, selling insurance, all this kind of stuff. And so for me, I'm like, man, let me get this kid. You know, when I said, Hey, finish school, <laughs> like do that. This is the last year. Um, but I right. said, man, once you get done, I'll actually integrate you into the full process. We'll make you a full blown producer and you know, the rest will be history. Um, cool. so he's one of them. And then the VAs, you know, are a lot of the support on like email inbox management. Um, I've got one that shows up. I kind of took a page out, out of Wesley's, uh, Anderson's, you know, playbook and, um, they'll come to the meetings, type up all the notes. She's very good on organization. They've built out my whole producer, process notebook if you will so, like a courtroom stenographer <laughs> exactly yeah 100 100 percent. and so it's cool though because like a producer dude we need one of those to come to our we need one to come <laughs> to our monday meetings dave yeah just sitting in the back and so i built a whole system through our sharepoint we're on microsoft so we use like sharepoint teams one note i've got an entire system that will onboard a producer, give them scripting, give them videos, give them tutorials, give them training, give them step-by-step -step instructions, what state is what carriers, what product you need to contact, here's what you need for that product. I've also built a bunch of workflows with automation on the website side of things that somebody could just step in, read a script, take the information, set an appointment or get it to the service team or get it wherever and it just kind of happens. So. There's been a lot of building in the back end as well. I'm kind of sick like that. I'll be up at, you know, 9, 10, 11 at night just working on stuff. So. Same. So are, are you using the appointment setter specifically for trucking or across the board? For trucking. Everything? Yeah, I don't waste my time on. I mean, I, I to be honest, I couldn't even log into a personal lines carrier or like make changes on a lot of that stuff. I get family that want me to do stuff, but I've got great people that I just dish pass, pass, pass. Hey, they'll take care of you. You know, I get referrals all the time. And so is the, is the, is, it, is the only commercial you're doing the trucking stuff? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I've got commitments to great West and some of these partners I've got, which are lofty, lofty goals. And oh, I'm yeah. not going to, I'm not going to let that fail. You know what I mean? Like Jordan, I'm going to win regardless. So, yeah, no, I, I'm with you, man. I, I yeah. agree, and I agree with you. It's one of the reasons why we have a very limited number of carriers that we have direct contracts with. I'm, I don't want to have that conversation about why aren't you feeding me? Yeah, hundred percent. Cool. So now that you're through seventy five hard, you're having this massive growth. How are you going to take the the mental toughness that you've gained and the momentum that you have and parlay that into? an exceptional 2022 do the living my best year workbook again. And I feel like I didn't set my goals high enough the first time, even though they were ridiculously high when I set them. Right. And I, and I have a weekly accountability meeting uh, with Mike Crowley, David, you know, Mike, he's been a guest on the podcast. He's a good mm -hmm. buddy. Weekly. We talk, we talk life, business, relationship, whatever you want to talk about an hour. It's like religious. We don't miss this meeting. And we were talking about that actually because reflecting on the last quarter coming into fourth quarter where we go hard also thinking about next year and it's like hey set your uh, sights a little bit higher even though i thought i did um not to say it was easy to accomplish but i think the big thing i took away and somebody we were talking about this at dinner the other night is what did you learn and i'm like well i learned a lot of people have excuses mm -hmm. <laughs> of why they can't i don't use the word can't try not to uh, I learned that you do have time. People want to say, I can't work out twice a day. I don't have time for that. 
It's like, well, I run a business. I do this. I got family. I coach my, you know, six year old daughter's soccer team. I got all this stuff that I do and I make time, wake up earlier, stay up a little bit later, go at lunch, like do what it takes in order to accomplish that. And so for me, just setting these habits and health was a big one for me, David, you and I have chatted many times on this is these positive habits and just reinforcing positive eating. I can tell you what eating clean and not drinking over the last, you know, two, three months. And then that ended, we're like, all right, we're getting a maple bar. <laughs> you know, we're going to do this we'll get some pasta, man. I felt yeah. like shit. I'm right. still recovering from that. My workouts kind of suffered. I noticed that. And I'm like, Oh, this is how it, I used to. It's not worth it, man. You know, yeah. I remember yeah. the first time I did whole 30 and you know, you're not allowed to have any kind of dairy or cheese or anything like that. And I think the first day off it's all that inflammatory stuff, man. It makes you feel like there, shit. Hey, listen, there's a reason why they also have a reintroduction process when you're <laughs> done with whole 30. I went out, I think I pounded like a cheese pizza, got a big bowl of ice cream. Oh my and God. I, I found out very quickly that my body does not appreciate lactose. Like it used to, man. I didn't no. realize that was a thing, but it was significant. Like I felt like yeah. somebody whacked me in the gut with a two by four. After yeah. just eating cheese and in in uh, ice cream, and I'm thinking, I literally used to eat cheese and ice cream daily, and <laughs> it's not worth it. Like I, I, I'm at the point, like yeah, do I do I appreciate a fine cheese? I absolutely do, and prefer extra of it. But it's not worth it if it makes you feel like like complete garbage. And so I think when it's I moderation my... too, though, right? Like yeah, I mean, if you sit is. there and dust a 16 inch from Papa John's, <laughs> and then... let me explain to you. Let me just explain to you my what I'm known for in my college circles. <laughs> I would buy I would buy two of the Tombstone five cheese cool. pizzas. Can I tell you that Tombstone is so underrated? I love. I am a total degenerate when it comes to Tombstone. Love well, it. Well, let me just Continue. tell you what I would do. I would cook two of them at the same time, and then I'd put them on top of each other. <laughs> just make like and a calzone. Next level. Yes. So that I was okay. eating like stuffed a, Tombstone pizza. Did you do it a la mode and just throw a nice scoop on top too? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what would have been awesome is if I put marinara and then another layer of cheese on the oh, top. Gosh. And then Yeah, yeah but I would eat, I would eat right, both of them much. at what. Both of them at one time. I would eat both of them. That's Two whole tombstone pizzas. No that's problem. That's incredible. And I, I did the same. So I had our soccer party to celebrate the year end of the pink glitter lollipops, which obviously I came up with that name for my six-year-old daughter. Uh, and we had a pizza party, and I smashed some pizza. I was like, I've been waiting 75 yeah. days for this moment. Right. I'm to Papa and uh, you crawled to the car. Oh my right. gosh. Yeah. And I've crawled the next two days, but I did. You know what I did though? I woke up the 76th day, got up, went and worked out. There you go. Read yeah. I mean, book, it creates it. it I think it's designed water. to create that habit so that you just yeah. continue it. And then I, <laughs> past then I worked out a second time. So I kind of committed and actually leading into it, um, I was a little bit nervous to kind of come up towards the end of this because I'm like, man, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. is this an excuse to go back and be lazy again and like be mentally weak again and then i like follow david goggins and stuff you know i listen to kind of some of the things he puts out so i i kind of cite that in my mind when i start thinking like a little bitch and it's like <laughs> no man you can't do that so I, I i decided okay i'm gonna commit to the two workouts a day gallon of water i read anyway Truth be told, I was more guilty of listening to audiobooks than I was physically reading, but I actually fell in love again with reading a physical book. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep reading books and um, I won't take the progress pictures. Maybe once a month take a progress pic because I still got, you know, 30, 40 pounds that I want to shed. And I'm not a like a number person to hit a weight. I want to feel good, but I know where I yeah. know I felt good in the past. So I want to get in that range. And just kind of keep hammering. And I think it's instilled and ingrained this uh, ability to create time and do repetition. And let's say I want to, like David, you know, he does a lot of video content. I want to do more video. And so just put it on the schedule in the block and say, okay, this time's content creation. This time's creating a blog. This time's doing, you know, whatever. And then you just put it in the schedule, man, and just kind of stick to it. So it's been how do you How do you keep from letting other things slide in there like how do you make sure that it's a priority like it's blocked off but it can be very easy especially you know um in in the position that both of you guys are in where you you're dealing with other things got fires that need to be put out like how do you balance okay this is the time that i've blocked and this is what it's for but this is also super important and this just happened 
Great question. I leave room for some flexibility. So I've got intentional space open on the calendar that I can bump or move or shift if it's important enough. But does it, what's important? Is it important to you that I do right. it or is it actually important? Sure. So like we'll make that determination and figure out if it actually needs my attention, we'll deal with it because you're right. I, I, I've got, what are we at? Like 36 or I don't know. So people in my organization and yeah, you yeah. bet there are things that come up that I got to deal with. Um, but other than that, I'm pretty strict, man. You call during that time, you're not getting me. Leave a <laughs> message. If it's an email, Brandon told me that the expectation is not to get a reply for 27 hours. I don't even look at my email. I don't even open it. An email is my worst form of communication. Ask Crowley. He, he drives him nuts. But um, So, yeah, I think you just schedule time to be willing to be somewhat flexible. And the, the hard things that can't be interrupted, how do they get a hold of you? You know what I mean? And you'll get back. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I think we do that to a degree, Kyle, with the stuff that we learned when we had Laura Lepresti come in and do the Outlook training on how mm-hmm. to effectively schedule your day the right way and, mm-hmm. and all of that. I mean, I'm probably not – it's completely disciplined with it as I need to be, but I can tell you this, I completely operate off my calendar, yeah. period. Yeah. Like I tell people, I'm like Ron Burgundy in the teleprompter with my calendar. <laughs> Like I will do whatever I read on my calendar, period. Yeah. And you got to hold like calendar is religious, right? I think Mm -hmm. what happens when people take on the task of box scheduling and and I'm guilty uh, is when you first do it, man, you pack your schedule full. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And this times this and this and this. And like, man, look how productive I can be. And then it's like, okay, if I can do 70% of that, I'm still more productive than 90% of people. But then it becomes... And I don't know about you guys. I'm a little bit rebellious, like, hey, tell me what to do and I won't do it type thing. And so the calendar becomes this thing. Tell me what to do. It took me a long time to figure out, like, no, you have to do the calendar. It's religious. It helps you. Um, and it was like a lot of like therapy with me in the calendar to get to the point of me accepting <laughs> it, telling me what to do. So I finally did. But create that space. Don't overbook it and have just like maybe three things, major things that I got to get done. If I knock these three dominoes over, they'll knock a bunch of dominoes over in the long run and being very visualized with goal setting, mapping out your year, mapping out your month, your quarter, your week down to, I guess the minute there. Um, But giving yourself some grace and just having some flexibility within that. And just knowing, Hey, if you get off today, have a list of things you got to do tomorrow and get back on, do it again. Just like a diet workout. Anything. Yeah, but there's, there's things you can do. Like you can send your phone to voicemail. You can X yeah. out of your outlook so that you don't have those distractions. Like if you're supposed to be working on a specific project, you know, you can do the things you need to do to keep yourself from getting the distractions. You know, a lot of it is just mm-hmm. setting yourself up from success at the very beginning. Hundred percent. And why are you worried about that? Is that your anxiety and your fear saying, man, I got so much to do and this fire's like eating me alive. I need to address this or that. I think if you have a plan and psych- psychologically know, hey, I've got time scheduled to deal with that. I think your body's like or your mind's like, OK, I don't have to worry about this right now because I know at this time I'm going to address that. And so you don't get distracted. You're very single minded focus. And I don't know about you guys. I can't multitask for shit. Uh, so it, you just are a lot more effective. And then once I saw the results, like legit, my goal is to double my income. I'm on pace to double my income. Like once nice. all these things actually fell in place and I implemented, and that's a big word there, David, is if I was ever asked to speak at a conference, it would just be, I don't want to say steal, borrow all these people ideas and implement. It's all implementation. And then you, you can achieve anything if you just try too many people get, paralysis or not what is it paralysis by analysis where they just yep. want to analyze freaking everything and want to know the answers and every outcome and it's like look man you got option a or option a execute and if you don't execute okay on the fly make some uh, tweaks and adjustments to make it work or do something else i am the exact opposite of paralysis by analysis because <laughs> i just hit it and go with it and i'll course correct or cut bait along the way 100 i think that so many people lose out on opportunities that way man like yeah. I might I might fall flat on my face like eight eight out of ten times, but nobody's ever going to say, "Wow, you really missed that one. You missed that opportunity." No, because I will hit on the two out of ten that supersede the eight that I lost on literally every time. So yeah. I've gotten to the point now where I'm fearless with that stuff. I don't I don't let it bother me anymore. You know, 
Yeah, and I agree. You know, one of the books, two of the books I read uh, were by Tim Grover, yep. Relentless winning. and Winning. And yep. my wife, my wife, I swear, was going to punch me in the face every time she saw me. She's like, you are so positive. She's like, quit coming in here with this stuff. And I'm like, you know, I'm like getting amped up and, you know, like ready to win all day. And I'm like, man, this guy knows my language. He's speaking to me. And but it's so true, though. So many people give themselves excuses or opportunities to opt out or what ifs and that. And I'm like, what if? Like, what if? Like, what's the worst that's going to happen? We become homeless. Yep. That's the worst that's going to happen. Right. I'll buy another house. We'll make more money and buy. Now, you can't say that to your wife because they need that security and they need to feel confident in you. And, hey, you're not running you into the ground. And, baby, there's no option. I'm not failing. I promise. I will succeed no matter what. So. No, and I think it's important, man, that you get the spousal buy-in. You know, I talk about it all the time. The whole yeah. reason I have my agency is because of my wife. Be, yep. be, for exactly what you said, I wasn't willing to go start a scratch agency. You know, I had been at, at the, the first agency that I worked at was a, a smaller Main Street shop type place where I wrote a ton of bops and, and artists and contractors, small stuff. Then I went to the the, the new startup, which is now a freaking gargantuan middle market agency with a national presence. But that, I started from scratch there. I started from scratch. I started from scratch again a year and a half later. Three years later, I launched an, another agency with two partners, started from scratch again. That was absolutely an abysmal experience. And after eight years, I left, started Florida Risk again. So like literally over the course of the last 15 years, I've started over four or five times. And I wasn't willing to do that again. And my wife was like, look, all you ever do is bitch about the things that you would do if you had control. Go get yourself control. Go launch the agency. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't it didn't hurt that she's got a good job, but for me that really didn't matter. There's two things that bothered me. Number 1, I didn't want any risk at all for them. I wanted to make sure that my family was going to be cared for and provided for with no problem. And the second that and so when I knew that I was going to be starting over naturally, I felt like I needed a security blanket, which is crazy to think that way now. But the second piece of it was that um, in addition to giving them the security blanket, I I was in a point in my life where I was ready to just say, screw this, man. I'm over it. I don't I don't want to have to start over again. I, I, I would like to have a paycheck coming in, you know, and, and she basically got behind me and said, look, you know, and, and, and then the third thing I would say, too, is the male ego. Right you know, call it what you want. I don't, you know, we have a lot of female listeners of the podcast. We try and highlight as many female producers and, and people in the insurance world as we can. In fact, I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage any of you that are listening that are females or know of a good female producer you would like to refer to us, please do so. Just shoot me an email at david at killingcommercial.com or shoot me an, e uh, uh, an instant message on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever. But, you know, the male ego is a real thing, man. I, you know, and especially when we're competitive, right? When we're, when we're in, when we're type A, savage, competitive people, we want to be the breadwinner. I, I understand that's an old school stereotype and we need to get past it, but it doesn't mean as a man that you, I just think there's certain things in our DNA that we can't escape, right? Like that's yep. part of it. You want that. You want to be the one who provides, you want to be the one that brings the discipline and the structure to your family. And it's okay if your wife plays part of that role or whatever, yeah. but you, you want to be the head of the household. You don't want, you don't want to have your ego blasted by all of a sudden now your wife is, is earning the entire household income that no. didn't sit well with me. And I try to be really mindful of bringing on new folks to our organization of getting the buy-in from the spouse and making them understand what the next few years of their life looks like. And even to the point of if they want to talk to my wife, because she's been a day one since, you know, the beginning of time, this is what you can expect. But I promise there is light at the end of the tunnel and it's going to be the best thing you've ever done investing in yourself and getting this mindset of exchange of time for value and money out of the mindset of, hey, I'm going to clock in for these hours and get paid in two weeks. It doesn't work that way in sales. You know, so really setting those expectations. And as a father of two little girls who are going to be phenomenal in whatever they choose to do, I, you know, our, our per producer force is split 50 50 for female male. And our female producers are savage. They're they deadly dangers. And my wife, in fact, during COVID, she's a medical professional, dental hygienist, they shut down. 
You couldn't even practice because COVID shut it down. She says, how about I get licensed for insurance? Come help you. Great. You've been with me long enough. You've heard me long enough. Let's do it. She picks up the phone every time she cold calls, which she hates, by the way. But every time <laughs> she cold calls, I think she's listened to me enough. She'll land a $100,000 account every single time. Like, and I'm like, you're amazing. You need to just come work here. And <laughs> like, let's just be this powerhouse team. Um, she's, a, you know, she enjoys it to an extent. Um, but it's a lot to juggle. And a lot of people, I, I think they find it hard to turn it off at the end of the day. They can't separate or compartment compartmentalize or whatever the case is it's a little bit tougher for her because she's juggling the kids the household taking care of three kids we only have two but she's taking care of me too half the time so <laughs> there's all this stuff that comes into play but man they're amazing so I, I think they yeah we need a lot more which we are getting uh females in the insurance space which is amazing so i know plenty of wonderful wonderful ones and claudia mclean early on was a huge motivation for me huge mentor she took time out all these people took time out of their day to talk to me which was amazing that blew my mind because everybody in my city wouldn't give you the time of day uh no man i'm not going to share my secrets i'm not going to tell mm -hmm. you how i do it i'm not going to make you better or make the industry better you know as a tribal mindset which is fine it's a male ego thing like you said and it's like man it's like bro i don't wake up thinking about what you do i don't give a shit what you you know i don't care what you do um, I'm just trying to be better in general as a person and find the people that I seek, quote unquote, mentorship that I look up to. And I realized very quickly, I don't look up to many people, but I found them with groups like IAOA or Jason Cass Brainshare or making connections to people like you, man. I started to find great people in this industry and Claudia being one of them. Um, you know, there's there's tons that I can give shout outs to. But, yeah, it was a huge turning point in my career. So speaking of IAOA, not to give away the secrets of the convention or anything, but there was a pretty fun inter exchange where um, I got into it with Ric Flair a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah, so apparently Ric Flair now lives at the Marriott Waterside in Tampa. I'm not exactly sure why, but he's Seriously? still there this week. Yes, he's still there this week. He was there every day last week in the lobby bar. Because a so, loser. Dude, let me tell you something. Ric Flair, very good at entertaining, probably not so good with the money. Um, just guessing based on behavior. So we we based um, on this story alone. Yes. Oh yeah. So we went to dinner. We went to dinner with uh, I went to dinner with James Jenkins and, and Jason Kilgo the Tuesday night before we had the boot camp. And and James had screwed up his hotel reservation somehow and he ended up crashing at my house that night but um kilgo went back into the hotel and as james and i were pulling back in kilgo calls all excited like hey man you're not gonna believe this rick flair's in the lobby of the hotel he's at the he's at the hotel bar right now do, do you want me to go up and talk to him and see if i can get him to come up and give a couple of sentences to kick off the boot camp and get everybody amped up tomorrow i'm like dude if you feel froggy jump man you know i don't know who would get people more electric than rick flair out of the box right so he goes up and talks to flair and Flair's like, yeah, you know, I'd love it. I'd, I, I, I'd, that'd be great. I'd be happy to come up and go five or ten minutes or whatever. He goes, my, my standard price tag for that's thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I get it. So Kilgo calls me back and says, look, now he said he would do it, but you just got to know it's going to cost you thirty thousand dollars. I'm like, you're absolutely <laughs> nuts. Tell Kilgo to no. sell that chain he was wearing. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so he's. I don't know if I was within earshot or Kilgo was relaying the information. But I told him, I said, you tell Ric Flair I can buy him on Cameo for $500, get a video, and I can use it every time I open up when I speak. I'm not paying him $30,000. He's nuts. And so Kilgo tells him, and I, I said, you can tell him. I'll give him $500 to kick it off tomorrow just, just to be cool about it. So he goes to Ric Flair and says, he'll give you $500, and Flair loses his mind. <laughs> like, cussing him out, telling him to get away from him, don't sit near him, all of this other stuff. And I'm screaming through the phone, you tell Ric Flair he needs me more than I need him if he needs $30,000 for five, ten minutes of his time. Seriously. So. Impromptu wrestling match would have been better. I would have paid for that. Well, it's so what's crazy is Davey Holt from IPFS shows up to innovation with three championship belts for the protege. Like wrestling belts. Legit oh, wrestling belts. Like heavy. 
heavy wrestling belts. I know because I had they to carry heavy, three of dude. them around the last day. <laughs> I picked um, when I I was surprised when I picked it up. So he's the one who brought those. I was wondering yeah. what the deal was with that. Okay. Yeah, like completely his idea. And so I walk in and the, and he pre- presents me with these wrestling belts. And now people are thinking maybe Carruthers has something staged with Ric Flair and he's just playing it cool. And I'm like, if Ric Flair comes anywhere near me, I will beat him down with this belt. <laughs> period. End of story. <laughs> he's like seventy something now. And by Easily. the way, it looks like he's a hundred and forty three. Yeah, yes. that'd be a crime. You'd go to jail for that. Ric Flair has not lived a, a healthy lifestyle. He's, I don't let's believe. just say he's not doing seventy-five hard. No, he would no. do. He would seventy-five. Do seven seventy-five and a half. hard yeah. days of cocaine. Yeah, seven and a half hard. It might be his <laughs> where he's at. But anyhow, There's well, listen, man. Somewhere. I want to. I got another meeting bumping up against this one, so I want to wrap this up, Cameron. Cool to have you back on. Yeah, Super yep. excited to send you what we send second time guests because few Ooh. have seen that so far. Got a new little situation that we've developed that goes out to people. So keep your eyes peeled on your mailman. You got a, you got a cool a package headed your way. Sweet. It is not a boat. It is a <laughs> picture of me just disposing of a bloody Ric Flair carcass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> yep. Uh, All right. Cool deal, man. Thanks for coming back on, yeah. Cameron. We'll catch everybody else next time. See ya. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.